Chapter Sixteen of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter Sixteen The New Client. She used her lorgnette upon the pair of guests when they were ushered in, but her interest in the silent boy was quickly transferred to the tall, attractive, blond man, with the flashing smile and the sparkling eyes, who greeted her daughter with such accustomed friendliness. "'Mama, may I present Mr. Barrison?' said Diana serenely. Philip's smile vanished, and he bowed. His manner, Mrs. Wilbur thought, was unpleasantly good. "'And this is Herbert Gain, Mama went on Diana. The boy's eyes roved to the plump lady, who came forward and took his hand. "'I knew your grandfather, my dear child,' she said, and she glanced over his shabby figure, appalled that the name of Loring could ever fall so low. Bertie said nothing. What did the lady mean by talking about his grandfather? No one but his mother had ever done that. A slight smile touched his lips as Mrs. Lowell greeted him, and then he looked over his shoulder and all about the flower-strewn room. "'Your uncle is not here,' she said quietly. "'He isn't coming, Bertie. We are going to have lunch alone.' The boy's melancholy eyes lifted to hers questioningly, she nodded reassuringly. "'Mr. Barrison, this is the key to Bert's room,' said Diana. "'Will you go up with him, and then return here? Luncheon will be ready.' Philip took the key, and, wondering, escorted his charge to the elevator. "'Bert's room,' he said to himself. When they arrived there, the flowers on the dresser caused him to remember Matt Blake's absurd account, and he felt his first questioning as to whether ice cream and a show or two really did cover the plans of these ladies for the boy. "'But where is Uncle Nick?' was his mental query. Herbert, second, looked about his bathroom. He had never seen anything in the slightest degree like it. "'Treating you pretty well, aren't they, old man?' said Philip, opening his bag and taking out the boy's worn brush and broken comb. "'Uncle Nick will be mad,' said Bert. "'I heard Mrs. Lowell say that he wasn't coming,' remarked Philip. "'Of course he'll come,' returned the boy. "'And he'll—he'll he'll beat me.' "'Bet you a thousand dollars he won't,' said Philip. "'Have you any money with you?' The boy felt in his pockets and brought forth a penny. "'That's all right,' said Philip gaily. "'If your Uncle Nick beats you, I'll give you a thousand dollars. And if he doesn't, you are to give me that penny. Understand?' Philip's smile was infectious. The corners of the boy's mouth twitched a little, the flowers on the dresser smelled sweet. So did the soap he was using. It was all like a wonderful dream. But over its brightness hung a dark cloud. Uncle Nick. "'All right,' he said vaguely. "'Hey, make it snappy, boy. I'm as hungry as a bear, aren't you? Here's a nail brush. Better use it.' Bert hurried and finally dried his hands and brushed his hair obediently. As much as he noticed anybody, he had always noticed and liked Philip, from the day that he watched him paint the inn sign, and now, in spite of his apprehensions, he felt some stimulation from the company of this big, strong man, who was going to give him a thousand dollars if Uncle Nick should beat him. While he was brushing his hair, the telephone rang. Philip answered it. It was Diana speaking. "'I want to thank you so much for doing this errand for us. I know you must be mystified by the urgency of my wire, 
and this is my best way to tell you in a few words what has occurred. You can see that the matter is confidential, for time and labor and the law will be necessary to adjust matters, but I feel we owe it to you to tell you all. Of course, the boy knows nothing as yet. When Philip finally turned from the telephone, he met his companion's troubled gaze. The hairbrush hung suspended in the air. "'Was it Uncle Nick?' he asked. "'No,' returned Philip. He continued to sit still for a minute, regarding the unconscious millionaire with a penny in his pocket of his outgrown trousers. "'It's all right, old man. Miss Wilbur wants us to come down to lunch, that's all.' As they went to the elevator to descend, the boy spoke again. "'Uncle Nick hates—he hates Mrs. Lowell,' he said. "'Good thing he isn't coming, then, isn't it?' returned Philip. "'But he'll—he will come some time,' said Bert with conviction. Arrived at Diana's suite, they found luncheon ready to be served— Mrs. Wilbur had vanished, not without some uneasy comments upon Philip, which Diana had answered with such utter serenity as to quiet any suspicion she might have entertained that there was something personal in her child's extraordinary attachment to the wilderness. The four sat down to the charming little meal, and, in spite of the boy's unconquerable apprehensions, he ate pretty well as he sat there, opposite Philip, and between Mrs. Lowell and Diana. The former asked him about the garden and the croquet ground, while Philip addressed himself to Diana, who wore the grey gown with a rose at the belt. Although she had felt she could never put it on again, the contents of a suitcase do not admit of much variety of costume. "'I'm almost dumb with surprise at your news.' he said. "'Of course you would be.' "'Does the ogre know of the arrival of relatives?' "'He has not the least suspicion of it. He will be told to-morrow.' "'Can a can be tied to him?' Bert was telling about weeding the garden with Veronica, and Diana leaned a little toward Philip. "'What—what what was your question?' Philip smiled. I asked if it would be possible to eliminate the gentleman. I think so. Mr. Loring's lawyer is, of course, attending to the whole matter, and is to see him for the second time to-morrow. Does anyone doubt that truth is stranger than fiction? No. Philip looked across at Mrs. Lowell and the sweet regard she was bending upon the boy— who was trying, in his hesitating way, to tell her something about the beach. Bert put his hand in his pocket, and Philip wondered if he were going to produce his capital, but, instead, he drew forth a little yellow stone and offered it to his friend. "'That is unusually lovely,' she said, and held it up to the light before she handed it back. "'No, it is for you.' said the boy. Sad as he may have maintained that it made him to be in this lady's company, her gentle presence was irresistible to him, and his face, as he handed back to her the little stone, had more interested expression than his friends had ever seen it wear. It is to go with the others in, in a bottle, he said. It is almost too nice for that. I think this is a little gem. Supposing I take it to a lapidary, a man who polishes stones, and have it made into a scarf-pin for you. No, for you, said the boy. Philip and Diana exchanged a look. There is the greatest thing in the world working again, he said. They had just finished dessert when Miss Wilbur was called to the telephone. 
Ask him to come up to my room, she answered. Is it Uncle Nick? asked Bert, his light extinguished. No, returned Mrs. Lowell, smiling reassuringly. You must remember, I told you he is not coming. Philip gave the boy his gay smile. Bert thought he was going to make a thousand dollars, he said, but the rusty springs of the lad's mind could not respond quickly. He looked at the young man questioningly. Don't you remember? added Philip. We have a bet up. One thousand dollars to a cent. The boy did not answer. He kept his eyes fixed on the door. Nothing which could be said was able entirely to quiet the apprehension that his uncle would walk in upon him, surrounded as he was by forbidden companions, and a luxury which his tyrant had not been invited to share. "'The gentleman who is coming to call on us is one who knew your mother,' said Mrs. Lowell. "'You will like to meet him.' "'Is he—is he angry with her, too?' asked the boy quickly. "'No, dear child,' returned Mrs. Lowell, compassion surging through her for this young life which knew so much of anger and so little of anything else. The noiseless waiters were removing all signs of the luncheon when the door opened and Luther Wren entered. As soon as he had greeted the ladies and Philip had been introduced, his smooth-shaven, keen face at once centered on the boy. Mrs. Lowell, her hand on Bert's arm, guided him to stand. "'This is Herbert Gain, Mr. Wren, and this is your mother's friend, Bertie.' The boy's plaintive, spiritless gaze, and the passive hand which the lawyer took bore out all he had heard of him. But Mrs. Lowell's expressive face was courageous, and the lawyer sat down beside Herbert Loring's heir, determined not to be outdone by her in hopefulness. Of course, he had been painstakingly told every detail concerning the boy which Mrs. Lowell had discovered, and it was a very kindly look with which he regarded his new client as they were seated near together. "'I brought my introduction with me, Herbert,' he said, and, feeling in a breast-pocket, he drew forth the card photograph which had yesterday been put into his hands. Color streamed over the boy's face when he saw it. "'It is—it is like one I lost,' he said, and he held it between his hands, studying it. "'You shall have this one, then,' said Mr. Wren. "'I was fond of your mother, Herbert.' "'They were angry with her.' said the boy, and his lip quivered at some memory. Yes, her father felt very badly because she went away from him, but he has gone to her now. Did you know that? The boy lifted his eyes to the thin, kindly face. No, he said. Yes, went on Mr. Wren quietly. Her father has gone to her in that pleasant world where she is. "'I want to go,' burst forth the boy, holding the picture tightly. "'Well, in good time,' returned the lawyer. "'You have some work to do for her here first. "'Do you mean weed the garden?' "'I mean quite a lot of very pleasant things. I'll tell you about them later. "'But Uncle Nick won't—won't won't let me. He—' I don't know whether I can hide this picture. A sudden panic seemed to seize the boy, and he looked toward the door. It was not possible that his uncle would not come in upon all these totally forbidden proceedings. See here, Herbert. Mr. Wren leaned toward the lad, speaking very kindly. I think it quite likely that you will never see your uncle again. Some thought made the boy's eyes dilate. "'He hasn't gone where—where where my mother is, has he?' "'No. I'm—I'm 
I'm glad. He'd... He'd spoil heaven, declared Bertie earnestly. Luther Wren nodded slowly. An excellent description, he said. The three observers of the interview smiled. Do you think you might adopt me in his place? added the lawyer. He... he wouldn't let me. He'll come, said the boy with conviction. Now, Herbert, said Mr. Wren, with reassuring calm, I know more about this than you do. I talked with your uncle yesterday, and I think he will give you to me. The boy's lips fell apart, and he stared at the speaker gravely. To me and to Mrs. Lowell. How would you like that? It was evident that this information could not be credited entirely, but the boy glanced around at Mrs. Lowell, who still sat close beside him, and she looked as if she believed this marvel. Unconsciously he pressed the picture against his breast. Luther Wren regarded the thin wrists and ankles protruding from the worn coat and trousers. "'Have you your sketch of your mother?' asked Mrs. Lowell. "'Will you show it to Mr. Wren?' The boy put his hand in a pocket, and drew out the small folded square, and the lawyer felt some obstruction in his throat as he saw the worn tissue paper and the morsel of oiled silk being so tenderly unrolled. "'When I lost the one like... like this, I tried to... to make another,' the boy explained. Luther Wren put on his eyeglasses and examined the little sketch. He looked at Mrs. Lowell and nodded. "'Save this,' he said to the boy. "'Go on being careful of it, for you will always be glad you made it. But you need never hide anything again. Do you understand that? We will get a case for this photograph, so you can carry it in your pocket, and I can have an enlargement made of it, so you can have it framed on your wall.' "'I haven't... Uh, haven't any money,' said Bertie, overwhelmed by these novel prospects, and convinced that this kindly visitor must be laboring under some great delusion. "'I just have... have one cent, but... but I have to give it to... to Mr. Barrison, if Uncle Nick doesn't... doesn't beat me. He... Bet me a thousand dollars. Luther Wren gave a queer, broken sort of laugh and wiped his eyeglasses. Mr. Barrison has won, he said. Always pay your debts, Herbert. Do you mean I, I shall give him the cent? Your last cent, yes. He was right, you see, and it belongs to him. The boy took out the penny and rising gravely, crossed to Philip and proffered the coin. Philip accepted it and bowed. "'You are an honourable gentleman,' he said. Bert returned quickly to his chair and again possessed himself of the picture which he had given to Mrs. Lowell to hold during the financial transaction. "'Now, Herbert,' said Mr. Wren slowly, "'I see that you are thinking that Photograph cases and frames cost money. You will be glad to know that your grandfather, your mother's father, who has now gone to her, has left you some of his money. If you think of anything special that you would like to have while you are here in Boston, you can buy it. No one present ever forgot the boy's face as he spoke, looking up into the lawyer's eyes. "'A pencil?' he said. Luther Wren nodded and swallowed again. "'Yes. Pencils, paper, sketch-blocks, brushes, paints, anything you want. Just tell Mr. Barrison. I think he will take you out presently and get you the clothes you need.' The boy looked down over his old suit, quite dazed and more than ever certain that all this must be a dream, and that he should waken on his cot at the island and 
find the familiar dark face bending over him and some greeting like get up stupid assailing his ears but he did not waken mrs lowell put her arm around his shoulders and gave him a little squeeze and when he looked up he found her smiling at him mr wren addressed her the more i see of the boy the more i recognize a resemblance to his mother he rose and crossed to philip who got to his feet mr barrison we are greatly indebted to you and we wish to be more so can you oblige us by dressing this young client of mine this afternoon delighted replied philip what has he brought with him a brush and a comb and a toothbrush all veterans and all wounded very well if you will get for him everything a boy needs for the remainder of the summer only i shall be greatly obliged mrs lowell will make the list i am sure and you can help her out if she gets lost have everything charged to me here is my card with the order and here is a check for your travelling expenses on this trip it's too much said philip as he saw the figure pretty accurate said the lawyer i'm calculating that you'll stay in town over one night at least if there's a balance you might send some roses to the door opened and a very dignified and extremely curious little lady entered a quite plump and not entirely pleased little lady some roses to mrs wilbur finished the lawyer do you hear that mrs wilbur asked philip mr wren is telling me i may send you roses is that one word for me and two for himself the lady shrugged her marvellously fitted shoulders but she smiled even she could not help responding to philip's vital spark it is my own private feeling that some attention should be paid to me she returned lifting her chin philip approached her name your colour he exclaimed with an air of devotion i think it will be a real pleasure to him mamma said diana smiling to turn from an immersion in sublunary matters like socks and neckties to a poetic purchase why should mr barrison be about to bathe in socks and neckties he is kind enough to take the matter off my hands mrs wilbur and make our young friend fit said the lawyer the lady lifted her lorgnette and surveyed the silent boy mr wren approached him herbert you have no reason to like the name of gain what do you say to dropping it what do you say to being herbert loring second if mrs lowell says so he responded he might have said what's in a name for the excited colour had settled in his cheeks let them call him what they liked he was going boldly and unafraid to have a pencil end of chapter 16「Seventeen of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Lufer. Chapter Seventeen The Air. Luther Wren gave himself the luxury of calling at the Copley Plaza the next morning, perhaps as a bracer for his afternoon appointment. When he sent up his name, he received a summons to come to a room on the floor above Diana's. Entering, he found the group he had left yesterday, minus Mrs. Wilbur, chatting and laughing before a boy's wardrobe spread out on the bed. As he shook hands with the boy himself, the lawyer looked him over with satisfaction. From the barber to the haberdasher, the lad had evidently been served well, and, though pale and thin, Herbert Loring second stood there a credit to his name already, and full of promise for the future. A wardrobe trunk in steamer size stood at one side of the room, and a fine suitcase beside it. "'Is everything all right, Herbert?' asked Mr. Wren, with a hand on the boy's shoulder and his eyes wandering over the variety of apparel laid out on the bed. 
Nothing seems to be missing. I have... I have blue pajamas, said the boy. And did they sleep all right, eh? They did not, said Philip. I had the other room, opening up off Bert's path, and I prowled once in a while to see how the land lay, and the electric light was evidently too easy. He was always examining his box. What box is that? asked Mr. Wren. The boy was keeping lifted eyes on him, not quite sure whether this dispenser of gifts was going to be displeased at the burning of midnight electricity. At the question, he hurried to a table and brought the new sketching material which had interfered with his dreams. Mr. Wren gave the boy's shoulder a little shake and laughed. "'They won't run away in the night,' he said. "'Better sleep and keep your eyes bright. "'When do you plan to return to the island, Mrs. Lowell?' She was sitting with Diana by the bed, where they were sewing markers on Bert's new possessions. "'If your afternoon interview proves satisfactory, and you can arrange that we shall not be molested, I think we might go to-morrow,' she replied. "'Want to go back to the island, Herbert?' asked Mr. Wren. The appealing eyes, so like Helen Loring's, were winning him more and more with their trustfulness. I don't care where we go if he, if nobody takes me away from, from Mrs. Lowell. You dear youngster, said that lady, her swift needle stitching busily. Well, it is my intention that nobody shall, for the present. Of course, when these charming ladies hamper themselves with husbands, it brings in an element of uncertainty. What sort of man is Monroe Lowell now? I suppose his wife is entirely impartial. Mrs. Lowell laughed. The finest ever, she said. But I see signs of impatience beginning to show in his letters, so I hope he will soon join us. Probably I know what you are thinking of, Miss Turin, but let us not cross any bridges until we come to them. The right way is sure to open. The lawyer nodded. I'll let you have a bulletin as soon as the final farewells are said this afternoon. I hope to secure the island from further intrusion. Diana looked up from her work. Would it not be well to offer him money not to return? Philip, who was engaged in snipping the markers apart, spoke. If he comes, I can take the bone of contention to my place until the hurricane is passed. I am quite certain he will not go, said Mrs. Lowell quietly. Why is that? asked Mr. Wren. I must confess to some qualms myself. Because it is not right for him to go, said Mrs. Lowell. My dear young lady, the lawyer smiled. If that is the only ground for your belief, my limited observation of the gentleman suggests that he never has done anything right in his life, unless by accident. But no money, Miss Diana. Start that once with that individual, and you'll be purchasing something from him at intervals the rest of his life. I must be off. Goodbye, Herbert. The boy started. He had been hanging over his treasures and handling them, oblivious to everything around him. This gentleman, who knew his mother, and had showered upon him so many benefits, was looking at him now with kind, serious eyes, and Bert became mindful of a little talk Mrs. Lowell had had with him this morning. He walked up to the lawyer and held out his slender hand. "'I thank you, sir,' he said. "'Good boy. I will see you again before you leave.' And, bowing to the others, Mr. Wren went out, Philip accompanying him to the elevator. "'Thank you, Mr. Barrison, for your good offices,' he said as they shook hands. "'Never had so much fun in my life,' said Philip. "'Made me wish I had half a dozen of my own, and the coin to treat them like that.' The lawyer bent his heavy brows upon him and smiled. "'Are events shaping themselves toward that end?' That extremely charming young woman, who's been making you the slave of the lamp, is enough to turn any man's head. Philip flushed. 
any man's head would be turned he responded quickly if he thought of her as approachable no oh, some common mortal for me some day i hope but she's a goddess you know the young fellow smiled and the lawyer still regarded him and placed a hand on his shoulder never let anything like money rob you he said slowly and with emphasis goddesses have been known to stoop to mortals before this i think her parents would see to that responded philip laughing the elevator came and with one more nod of farewell the lawyer disappeared fierce job he's got before him muttered philip as he returned to the dry goods refusing to allow his mind to dwell on his new friend's surpassingly ignorant suggestions promptly at the appointed time nicholas gain presented himself at the lawyer's office and was admitted to the sanctum his air of assurance almost reached the swaggering stage and his how are you breathed a suggestion of a fortifying beverage without waiting for permission he fell into the chair near the desk well are you satisfied he asked triumphantly yes i am satisfied that the boy is my old friend's grandson i knew you would be now how soon do you think you can fix it up fix what up the inheritance i told you the boy was not mentioned in the will i know that but what's the law for if it can't get justice done came the impatient question and gain's chin shot out belligerently it can and will get justice done said luther wren slowly but it will take time oh of course i know it will but you can advance money on a sure thing and i'll make it worth your while as soon as the cash is in my hands in yours the lawyer tapped his desk with a paper cutter yes i told you the boy's delicate he needs care i'm sure he does it may take a year to straighten out the matter of the will it don't need to said gain angrily i've had the expense of bert for five years i ought to be reimbursed and provided with enough money to care for him right until he gets all that's coming to him luther wren looked for a silent minute at the dark impatient face and thick powerful shoulders and hands and recalled the boy's panic i have obtained a good deal of information as to the occurrences of the past years as they affect mr loring's grandson he said quietly and his visitor scowled at him startled i'm a poor man he blustered i told you i hadn't been able to care for him right if you would like went on the lawyer slowly to be relieved of the boy i am willing to take charge of him from now on for his mother's sake for his mother's sake sneered gain you know damned well that it's because you know you can get hold of the money that ought to be his you have been drinking mr gain and the reason i don't have you put out of the office is because we shall never meet again and it is always well to settle matters out of court if possible i'm going to tell you instead of asking a judge to do so why i am taking helen loring's boy away from you lambert gain's boy and my nephew roared gain where do you get that stuff take him away from me after all the expense be quiet mr gain or i shall have to forego my peaceful plans i have a man outside prepared to take you so it would be better for you to listen to me nicholas gain looked behind him in angry amazement what have you done for that helpless boy went on wren quietly have you endeavoured to have him properly taught and cared for have you allowed him the happiness which would have cost you nothing of exercising the talent inherited from his mother i'm a poor man the declaration came out with a loud burst 
He couldn't spend his time like a nabob. No. So you took no pains to have him educated. You allowed him to be made to scrub floors and wash windows and do any menial work which a lazy, dissolute woman could put upon him. You allowed a creature like Cora to be his companion, caring less than nothing for the possible degradation of the boy's mind and body. Nicholas Gaines started up from his chair, purple in the face with surprise and fury. All this you did with the one single base intention of so beating down any sign of mental efficiency in your nephew that in time you could get the handling of his heritage. As the words fell clearly and concisely from the lawyer's lips, Nicholas Gaines' muddled brain worked fast. Where could this devil of a lawyer have learned so much in two days? The boy was at the island. It must be the women. That Mrs. Lowell. But how could she have connected Bert with Herbert Loring in the first place? And how could she, with her slight opportunity, have elicited so much from the dull boy and communicated with Luther Wren? Gain wished his brain were clearer, but, looking at the stony calm of the lawyer's face and the cold accusation in his eyes, he realized that the combination of legal power and money made it very hard in instances like this for a poor man like himself to get his rights. Now I will detain you only a minute longer, Mr. Gain. Herbert Loring II, as he will after this be called, is now at the Copley Plaza with friends. Gain started and seized the back of the chair from which he had risen, apparently for support. I shall provide for him as I think best. It is too early, as yet, to tell whether your criminal treatment of the child has worked permanent injury. Time, and the tenderest, wisest care will be necessary to establish that, and, meanwhile, you will be left in freedom. We desire to avoid all publicity, and if you keep out of the way, and do not intrude and awaken in the boy brutal and sad associations, we may succeed in restoring him to a normal condition. But I assure you, if you even show your face near the boy, or interfere in any degree, you will be called upon to answer serious charges, and witnesses will be easy to procure. The purple had faded from Nicholas Gaines' face, and it was ashy under the sunburn. He opened his lips to speak, but no sound came. Mr. Wren touched a button on his desk, and the office door opened. Gain started and looked toward it. "'I feel that we understand each other perfectly, Mr. Gain,' said the lawyer pleasantly. "'Good afternoon.' Nicholas Gain mumbled something, and, moving as swiftly as his unsteady knees would permit, he disappeared from that office, fear engulfing all his other emotions. He wondered which of the men in plain clothes whom he saw moving about outside was the one who might have been his escort. Luther Wren took up the telephone and called Diana. "'Mr. Wren speaking.' An excited voice answered all serenity thrown to the winds. "'Oh, Mr. Wren, is it over?' "'Yes, Miss Diana, and very satisfactorily. I'm a little tired, and I believe I won't make you another call today.' "'I'm sure you must be tired,' sympathetically. "'I just wanted you and Mrs. Lowell to know that you may plan to take the nine o'clock train for Portland tomorrow morning, with as much freedom as if our precious uncle had passed away from the planet. Thank you, thank you. And, by the way, Miss Diana, you may tell Mr. Barrison, too. Oh, of course I should. Do you know, I find him a very engaging young man. Why, why are your cheeks blooming so? 
can't one say as much as that for relaxation after a nasty quarter of an hour a soft gurgle of laughter went to the listening lawyer i did not know you ever condescended to such play mr wren well don't tell will you my best wishes to you all and especially to herbert and tell him i shall come to the island to look him over in a short time do mr barrison will take you fishing is he always successful does he know just what bait to use another soft gurgle you don't understand mr wren he uses too much bait he catches too many fish good-bye my mother has just come in she's going with us to maine a pause she hopes to see you there good-bye before the arrival of the Copley Plaza contingent at the island, Matt Blake received the following letter. Dear Matt, you know the business that brought me to Boston. I proved my position all right. The old man's lawyer couldn't deny it. But the boy, not being named in the will, as of course I knew he wouldn't be, the lawyer said it would take a long time before he could get anything for Bert, and advised me to put the boy into his hands. So I'm going to let him run matters to suit himself. I'm asking you if you'll be good enough to pack up my stuff at the island and send everything on COD to the address on the card I enclose. You know what I found at the farm, but I've got to wait till I can get some backing before I can do anything about it. Keep it under your hat, though. You know what I left at the farm, too, out in the kitchen. Take that for your trouble. I don't know what I'm going to do next. What I do know is that a lawyer has no more blood than a turnip, and that a man can go to the expense and trouble of taking care of a boy for five years, and then be asked to hand him over to those that know he'll have money, without even a thank you for all he has done. I'm disgusted with the world. Your friend, Nicholas Gain. When he read this, Matt Blake looked off thoughtfully, his thin lips twitching. "'I hope Phil Barrison can tell me all that's between those lines,' he thought. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of The Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter 18 Diana's Ideal. Come here, Aunt Priscilla! called Veronica at the top of her lungs. It was a joyous call, and Miss Burridge hurried into the dining room where, a few minutes before, she had left Veronica sweeping, and found her standing still and confronting a boy who stood, hat in hand, while on the floor beside him reposed a new and handsome suitcase. "'Would you know him, Aunt Priscilla?' Miss Burridge pulled down her spectacles and gazed at the trim figure with the immaculately brushed and parted hair. "'It ain't Bertie Gain. Why, it is. Where are the other folks? Somebody has been being awful good to you.' How could it be possible that the boy they sent away a few days ago could be the same one who looked at them now, with happy eyes and a faint smile? "'They're coming,' he answered. "'Mr. Blake brought me up, in his wagon, and the others had to wait for the car, and they were going to take a drive.' Matt Blake here appeared in the open doorway from the piazza, bearing on his back a shining new trunk. "'Where is this going?' he asked. "'I'll show you,' said the boy, and they made a procession up the stairs, Bert leading and the women bringing up the rear, full to the lips of questions ready to pour out upon Matt, who was smiling, eyes twinkling under his burden, at the amazed countenances of Miss Burridge and Veronica. "'Where's your Uncle Nick?' asked Veronica, when they reached the bedroom. "'No,' 
said Bert quickly. No, he isn't coming. Is it? cried Miss Burridge, as Blake set the trunk down. Matt, has Mr. Gain come in the money? This Mr. Gain has, returned Blake, grinning and indicating the boy. No, my name isn't Gain any more, said Bert gravely. I am Herbert Loring second. Not so, said Matt. There you have it, ladies. You've read about the prince and the pauper, haven't you? You sent away the pauper and got back the prince. Yes, said the boy. My grandfather gave me all these things, because he didn't need money any more. While the boy spoke, Blake noticed that he was looking at Nicholas Gaines' trunk. Kind of in the way, ain't it? That's a good place for yours to stand. We'll pull Mr. Gaines' trunk out here where I can pack it. He wants me to send him all his things. Bert's face looked as if sunlight suddenly struck it. It was as if, now only, he entirely credited the fact that there was nothing to apprehend in the way of a reckoning. You are going to send all Uncle Nick's things to him? Yep. "'Everything but you,' replied Matt jocosely. "'But I—I I don't belong to him any more,' explained Bert eagerly. "'He gave me to—to to the lawyer.' "'Good work,' said Blake, and lifting the lid of the old trunk he fell to opening the dresser drawers. "'Matt Blake,' said Miss Burge, "'will you tell me what has happened?' "'Ever hear of Herbert Loring?' one of Boston's rich men? Well, he died suddenly, and this boy's his grandson, and the lawyer has persuaded Mr. Gain to take his hands off. As an addendum to his explanation, Matt bestowed upon Miss Burridge a wink which seemed to say, more anon. And Mr. Gain isn't coming back? asked Miss Burridge, sundry financial considerations occurring to her. "'I guess he'll pay up all right,' said Blake, reading her thought. "'You make out what he owes. I'll see to it. "'Come on, Herbert Loring. Help me to get your uncle's duds together so I won't be packing any of yours.' "'That wouldn't make—make make any difference,' said the boy. "'Because Mrs. Lowell said for me not to wear them any more.' And he turned to with a will— emptying dresser and closet while Matt packed. "'I hear the motor,' said Veronica suddenly. Miss Burridge had been in a flutter ever since Diana's telegram, saying that her mother and maid would return with her. Miss Priscilla's outlook on life was placidly democratic, but somehow the prospect of having to care for the wife of the steel magnate loomed as something overwhelming— she and Veronica hurried downstairs to meet their guests. Mrs. Lowell and Diana were in high spirits. Leonie had fortunately discovered some resemblance in the island to a fishing village of her childhood, and had sat with Bill Lindsay on the front seat coming up. He understood her trim appearance, even if half of what she said so volubly was lost to him. The springs of the machine were not reminiscent of Mrs. Wilbur's Rolls-Royce, and her lorgnette had not yet been able to discover what charm this corner of the world had exercised upon her daughter. She had been predisposed, from her first view of Philip Barrison, to give him the credit, or discredit, and during the trip from Boston she had kept one eye upon every move he or Diana had made toward the other. But the examination had revealed nothing. Philip had not even been assiduous toward herself. She would have suspected that instantly. As a matter of fact, almost all the way to Portland, he had concentrated his attention on a book of Brahms songs, which were welcomed effusively by a curly-headed Irishman in white sweater and trousers, who met them when they landed from the island steamer. "'Is that the mother of the goddess, then?' he said, when he was presented. "'You lost your heart, I'm sure, to that ride down the bay, Mrs. Wilbur.' "'It was very lovely. I should like to come around here in the yacht some time. 
the rudder chain or whatever it was on that little boat nearly banged a hole in my head diana smiled on kelly mamma has been rubbing it that's all she said i warned her philip had telephoned down to bespeak the motor in order that the august mrs wilbur might not be obliged to linger on the wharf where on account of the adjacent fish-house the elders were not always of araby and the only seat was a weather-worn board a little wider than a knife-blade diana leaned out of the car just before they drove away and offered him her hand have i thanked you nearly enough mr barrison she asked and barney kelly observed her melting eyes you have filled in every need and been an untold help to us all in this affair even mr wren said the nicest things about you and about you returned philip pressing her willing hand i think mr wren has had the time of his life the last few days it has been very exciting very happy had we not better start diana put in mrs wilbur i just caught a glimpse of a dreadful fish over there by a post do they catch whales here they stop at nothing mrs wilbur barney assured her good-bye good-bye the motor sped off with a grinding noise you put your time in well eh barrison what makes you think so my word if miss wilbur ever turned those lamps on me with that look in them i'd fly right in and singe my wings for life i don't intend to singe mine said philip quietly they think i've been useful in this little one-act play they've been staging and are grateful that's all the goddess is as transparent and honest as any child that ever lived she doesn't want to light any flame for the moth she has far too big a soul did you notice that boy i took away looked different from the one we brought back today. It wasn't the same one, was it? Yes, with a few renovations in mind and body. I'll tell you about it as we go along. When Mrs. Wilbur went out on the end piazza and was assailed with the island sights and odors, the snowy daisy drifts, the dark evergreens, the rock lashed foam dragging at the pebbles and flinging them back with a never-ceasing crescendo and diminuendo, the soaring, sweeping gulls above and beneath the blue. She did not speak for a time, and it was a place where her lorgnette failed. Leonie, however, kept up a joyous undertone. Mais c'est comme chez moi, c'est vraiment comme chez moi, at mr Peel, he will take me to see the poisson mr Peel kept his word and not once but many times did mrs wilbur look about vainly for her maid in a place where there was no bell to ring for her and no clocks for her to see when she was without and bill's motor was running up and down the road in such a convenient way for him to stop and take on an eager passenger, for whom no fishing-boat was too dirty, and who could swim as well as any fish in the bay. "'Do let her go, Mama," Diana said one morning when they were alone. "'She's having a real vacation. When you are once attired and your hair is dressed, can I not perform any other office for you?' "'But I don't know which is the maid, Leonie or I,' said Mrs. Wilbur. First, she had to have a sweater, and I sent for that. "'Then she wanted a bathing-suit, and I sent for that. "'Then she bought herself some fishing-tackle, "'and if she can't get out in a boat, "'she sits on the wharf with her feet hanging over "'and fishes for those, those... "'Cunners,' suggested Diana. "'Yes.' and she knows every one of the island boys and how does she know when i need her she doesn't think anything about it that's it returned diana nodding she has lost her head that is what we all do you will too mamma i heard you laughing and laughing with mr kelly yesterday 
"'He is such a droll creature,' said Mrs. Wilbur, with a reminiscent smile. "'It's such a queer place here,' she went on with a puzzled brow. "'You could put this whole inn into the ballroom at Newport, "'and there isn't enough space to turn around in the little rooms. "'Yet, out of doors, it's all space, "'and something in the air makes you want to run and jump.' "'I might as well tell you, Diana. "'My mind is just getting set at rest on the subject of Mr. Barrison. "'Your craze for this place seemed unnatural, "'and when I first saw him in Boston, "'I suspected that he was the cause.' "'The lady met her daughter's calm eyes, "'which contradicted her changing colour. "'What should have disturbed you about that?' "'asked the girl quietly. "'Disturbed me? That you should have come off here alone, and fallen in love with nobody knows who!' "'Oh, a good many people are learning who. That is really the chief trouble with him. I mean, from a girl's standpoint. He is rapidly becoming one of the stars of the musical world.' "'And why is that a drawback?' Mrs. Wilbur began to feel somewhat bewildered by her daughter's attitude. Diana's color was rather high, but she turned toward her mother with entire calm. "'I am not going to marry a man whom other women besiege. My husband will be rather short. I think he will stoop and be nearsighted and wear spectacles. He will incline to baldness. "'But he will be very charming to me, and he will be mine.' "'The smile that accompanied this declaration was so winning "'that Mrs. Wilbur was startled. "'Diana, have you met any such person?' she returned. "'I don't like the sound of him at all.' "'Not yet,' admitted Diana. "'But I keep him in mind.' He fights off other types. Supposing, said Mrs. Wilbur sharply, some very desirable man, as attractive as Mr. Barrison, for instance, were to say he wouldn't marry you because you are too pretty. Other men would look at you. You do think he is attractive to you, Mama? Why, certainly, returned Mrs. Wilbur. "'not quite sure even yet that the admission was safe. "'The cases are not parallel,' said Diana. "'Women as a rule are more faithful, and men are conceited. "'The average man must have severe lessons "'before he believes that the woman who has loved him "'will turn to someone else.' "'Why, Diana, I am surprised at you. "'You talk in such a sophisticated way.' "'But, my dear, let me remind you that you have someone beside yourself to please when you marry. "'Your father may give you an unlimited cheque-book, but he won't give you carte blanche when it comes to marrying. "'He isn't going to welcome into the family any insignificant little scarecrow such as you are counting on.' "'If Philip wanted to hear Diana laugh, it was a pity he wasn't near now.' for she burst forth so merrily that Veronica peeped out the window. "'I see you are going to be as difficult as I am, Mama," she said at last. It was soon after this that the cottage people, with one accord, begged Philip to give a recital in the hall. The summer colony was an appreciative and cultured one. Many of them had known Philip from his boyhood, and were watching his career with interest. So it was an occasion of intimacy and delight. When the evening arrived, the hall was decked with flowers, and the singer and his accompanist appeared in white flannels. Philip was his own program, announcing his songs and receiving at times stentorian requests for special encores. Mrs. Wilbur, as she looked and listened, felt that she gained an understanding of Diana's arguments. Not that, in any case, she desired this young man for a son-in-law, but she was greatly surprised at the beauty of his voice and his art. 
It was a feast he gave them that night, in the uncalculating opulence of his youth and strength. Arias from Bohème and La Tosca, the dream song from Manon, ballads, a group of modern French songs, another of Old English. Barney Kelly's accompanying was perfect. He was among strangers, and he was as serious throughout as if they were performing in Carnegie Hall. Despite the fact that the piano was an upright, he played a group of Chopin, Palmgren, and Debussy with great charm, and the contingent from the inn led the strong applause. As he bowed, Kelly recognized Veronica's rosy, serious face and wildly active hands. At the close of the recital, Mrs. Wilbur was more excited than she had been for years. "'He's wonderful, Diana,' she said, standing up while she was still in the throes of hand-clapping. "'Wonderful! We must try to get him for an October date in Pittsfield. Our room is quite large enough. He will make a sensation.' "'Yes,' said Diana, rather faintly. "'That is the easiest thing he does.' Her face was pale. The possible charmer with the bald head and spectacles had had a hard fight tonight. Barney Kelly disappeared through some back door while Philip's enthusiastic friends gathered around him, and Veronica dashed out on the front piazza, cleared the steps in two bounds, and the July moon aided her progress between the bushes to the back of the hall, where a figure in white was straying. "'Mr. Kelly!' she called breathlessly. "'You were perfectly splendid. Why didn't you stay and let the people tell you so?' "'Oh, I don't know them,' said Barney carelessly. "'And they want to eat up Barrison.' "'But they want to eat up you, too. Didn't you see how crazy they were about that last funny out-of-tune thing you played?' Kelly laughed. "'And don't you go away. They're going to dance.' "'Oh, do they want me to play?' "'Don't you dare play! Don't you dare let him know you can!' Barney laughed again. "'Well, of course they know you can, but not dance music!' "'You're a very nice child, Veronica.' Barney looked at her little dimpled rose face and the pale green dress she wore. "'Well, if I am, then come around to the front piazza with me. They're setting back the chairs.' Meanwhile, Mrs. Wilbur was drawing Diana toward the group surrounding Philip. "'I don't know what to say to you that won't sound too effusive,' she said, as soon as she could get his attention in his hand. "'Will you come to us in October and sing a recital?' "'I shall be glad to, if I can. I'll see about my dates.' As Philip replied, he looked at Diana. She gave him a pale smile and said nothing. More people approached, and Mrs. Wilbur drew away, her daughter with her. "'Miss Diana,' said Philip across the heads of the crowd, "'we're going to dance. Will you stay?' Diana nodded. "'You like to dance, Mama. You stay, too.' "'Oh, not in this little place, where everybody will be stepping on everyone else. Besides, Leonie's beau is waiting outside to take us home.' "'I'll go with Miss Burridge and tell Bill to come back for you in an hour. "'I suppose you don't need a chaperone, "'for I don't see your ideal here tonight, Diana,' in a lowered voice. "'You were right about Mr. Barrison. "'Let us pray that women don't make a complete fool of him.' "'You don't look just right, dear. "'Don't stay late. "'I'll tell Bill to come back in an hour.' "'Oh, there is that comical Mr. Kelly.' Mrs. Wilbur sailed up to him. "'Thank you so much for this evening. You were delightful, Mr. Kelly. And Mr. Barrison is most fortunate in having you.' "'But you are not going, Mrs. Wilbur.' "'Yes, good night.' "'No, oh, not until you've danced once with me. There, the music is just going to begin.' And, sure enough, Miss Burridge stood back and waited while Mrs. Wilbur's little satin-clad feet tripped lightly around in the dance with the volatile Barney, and she talked to him about the date in October, and promised she would dance with him again at that time. 
Mrs. Lowell and Herbert had been enjoying the concert and had told Philip so, and now stood back, watching the dancing. "'Would you like to learn to dance?' asked Mrs. Lowell. "'No. It sounds better to say, "'No, Mrs. Lowell,' or, "'No, I thank you.' "'Then I will,' said the boy. "'I like to dance,' said Mrs. Lowell, "'and I wish you would learn.' "'Then I will,' said the boy again. The music had thrilled his artist's soul. It seemed all a part of the entrancing night, a part of the safe world of love into which he had been guided. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter 19 Moonlight Mrs. Wilbur looked back into the hall from the piazza before she stepped into the motor. Diana was already dancing with Philip Barrison. She watched their smooth movements for a minute, then turned to Mrs. Lowell, who had just emerged with her boy. "'This, this gathering, this settlement here, seems rather like a family party, doesn't it?' she said, with a sort of troubled curiosity. "'Yes. Nearly all of these people have known each other for many summers. "'I feel a little strange to go and leave Diana.' "'I don't think you need,' replied Mrs. Lowell. "'I suppose,' said Mrs. Wilbur, "'if the steed were going to be stolen, it would have happened before this. "'The stable door has been open for weeks.' "'Quite so,' said Mrs. Lowell, laughing. "'It is so light. Bert and I are going to walk up to the inn.' "'I am going to send the car back for Diana in one hour.' declared Mrs. Wilbur. Her daughter's theories were all very well, but this was a distractingly beautiful night, and the echoes of that marvellous voice were even yet thrilling her own nerves. Leonie was sitting at the front of the car with Bill Lindsay, and Mrs. Wilbur mounted into the back seat with Miss Burridge. "'I suppose Miss Veronica will return with my daughter?' she said. "'I only hope so,' returned Miss Burridge resignedly. "'Mr. Kelly has promised to see to her.' "'I don't feel like dancing,' said Diana, as her partner guided her through the narrow spaces. "'No one would suspect it,' he replied. "'I was just thinking that this night was to be superlative in all directions.' "'But how can one endure this silly music when Manon, Manon, is echoing through the heart?' Philip did not reply. Nor did he release her, until the gay strumming at the piano ceased. Then they went out on the piazza. The laughing, chattering young people were streaming out into the air and occupying every available seat. The field surrounding the hall was light as day. "'Let's go down to the rocks,' said Philip. "'I mustn't, because my mother is going to send the car back for me in one hour. "'You've no idea how firmly my mother can say one hour and mean it.' "'There should be no rules on a night like this.' "'Philip regarded his companion, pale in the moonlight as her pale, filmy garments. "'I feel like quoting a choice spirit of my childhood days.' He was trying to get me to go on a tear of some kind with him, and I told him my mother would worry. He said, Oh, come on. Scoldings don't hurt. Whippings don't last long, and she doesn't kill you. Diana smiled. Now that she is here, she likes to tuck me in, she said. I would she had waited until after the moon. Well, let us go to the near rocks. I'll keep watch of the time. They went down the populous steps. 
oh mr barrison exclaimed a woman upon whom he nearly trod what ecstasy you have given us it was miss emerson she was cooling off from a dance with mr pratt and was in high feather because neither he nor mr evans knew another woman present save veronica and her acquaintance though not wide seemed intensive yes that was corking said mr evans we sure do thank you say folks i'm tired i'm going to trot along back to the inn asked philip with interest yes anything i can do for you if you would be so kind mrs wilbur has just gone will you be kind enough to tell her not to worry if her daughter is a little later than she expected tell her you left her in good hands and we're going to walk up after a while certainly be glad to replied evans oh breathed diana softly as they moved on into the glory of the night i'm quite sure you should not have done that do you want to be shut up in a tin lizzie tonight no nor anywhere philip led her to the shore and found a corner among the rocks from which they could watch the beaten silver of the billows rushing tumultuously landward breaking in foam about their airy and slipping back in myriad bridal veils there is always one night in the summer and this is the night said philip think of viewing the moon in company with the goddess herself if you only wouldn't mind leaning against my arm i'm sorry to have that rock cutting into your dandy gown thank you but it doesn't i have a very good place here comfortable enough to tell me that you like the music diana looked around at him slowly and he laughed softly yes i know you did i know if ever i could sing i sang tonight there was something new in it it taught me something something i've been waiting for they've always told me my teachers that the one thing i needed was to fall in love it must have happened happened somehow when i wasn't looking philip crossed his arms behind his head leaned back and looked at the high sailing moon thank you great goddess diana i am at your feet you have dropped upon me a spark of the divine fire i build you an altar the flame shall never go out the girl beside him bit her lip and silence fell between them the bright billows swept in and crashed apart i suppose that is what love means to an artist she said at last the nourishing of his art that is all that is all it can mean to me he answered but isn't it enough an object to worship with all a man's strength receiving the return of inspiration she looked at him as he lay there reclining against the rock his upturned face not seeking hers this evening had shown her in miniature the truth of all she had felt and because her heart was beating fast she clung more strongly than ever to the spectacled gentleman with the scanty hair say something divine one he said suddenly turning to her don't confuse me with the moon mr barrison she warned him but at least can't you congratulate me yes i can on many things but don't fall in love with any ideal less impersonal than a planet i don't intend to but why these words of wisdom because any any mere mortal girl married to you would be miserable oh come now philip sat up and frowned at her with a quizzical smile so you think i ought to try kindness first do you why 
Diana turned her fair, moonlit face directly to him. Because you cannot ever belong to yourself even, much less to her. I don't quite get that. I can't speak for all girls, but for myself, if I ever have a husband, I want... I want to creep off into a corner with him. A corner like this rock? This is big enough. How would that suit the great Charles Wilbur? It would not suit him, I know that. The homely little stoop-shouldered man with the lovely soul, whom I mean to marry, will not altogether please my father. Philip's eyes grew big in the moonlight. Have you picked him out? Yes, as an ideal. Other women will leave me in possession of him. Ah, Philip nodded. I begin to see. They were both silent again. At last Philip spoke again. I deny that the girl you are warning me away from would have such a rocky time. What do you suppose I should care for the babble, no matter how kind it was, how sweet, even, of other women? I should see only her. You think so, said Diana. I know you think so, and at first it would probably be so. But a singer's appetite for flattery grows. Of course it does. I'm not blaming you. It's just your career. Silence again, until Philip spoke. Very well. I shall hunt you out in your corner with your faithful gnome, and I shall beg. He sang. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Philip sang the song entirely through, slowly and deliberately, and Diana closed her eyes, and the laces on her sleeve trembled. The glory of the night, the glory of the voice were all one. She shrank into her corner and held desperately to her ideal. When he had finished, Philip looked at her. Her head rested back upon the rock, her eyes were closed. The mysterious light lent her face a strange radiance. Diana, he said, and there was a thrill in his voice. You are well named. Goddess of the moon, you certainly are, and this night is an epoch in my life. I love, and in spite of your skepticism I shall be true. She opened her eyes and looked at him, and he drew a long, quick breath. I can't let you stay here any longer. Your wrap isn't enough. Now we will sprint up to the inn. Do you feel like it? Oh, is it over? She said softly. Yes. Or else it has just begun. I am not sure which, he answered and rising he gave her his hand and helped her to her feet. "'The moon is no farther away from me than you,' he said in the moment while he held her hand. "'I am not going to forget it.' "'Then it is I,' she thought, with a bound of the heart that turned her faint. They scarcely spoke on the long, heavenly walk up the island. The sea was starry as the sky with the lights of fishing boats, and phosphorescence gleamed where the water was in shadow. When he took her hand for good night on the piazza of the inn, she said, I haven't thanked you for this wonderful evening. You know I do, Philomel. He smiled down at her. That reminds me of our first meeting here. Philomel with melody, you said. I remember what I had been singing, too. 
it is still true. He kissed her hand, jumped over the piazza rail, narrowly missing the sweet peas, and strode away. The girl stood in the shadow watching the tall, white figure and listening to the waves of song that floated back through the moonlight. Thou art like unto a flower, so sweet, so pure, so fair. What shall I do? murmured the poor, bewildered moon goddess on the piazza. What shall I do? End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter Twenty Reunion. There was one case of happiness without drawbacks on the island at this time. It was in the humble, starved heart of Herbert Loring II. Each morning Mrs. Lowell came into his room after breakfast and made his bed, taught him how to take care of his belongings, and read with him from the books she loved. All traces of Nicholas Gaines' occupation having been removed, and every article the boy had used in the past dispensed with, his fresh new possessions were neatly arranged, and he waked each morning to a new and wonderful life. Mrs. Lowell encouraged his artistic work, and allowed him to spend as much time upon it as he wished. All fear being removed, his appetite revived, and one could almost daily see the flesh return upon his bones. His good friend, finding that his sapped energies recoiled from muscular effort, did not urge him to swim or to row, but fed his mind and heart and awaited his rebuilding. His story became known on the island, and from being ignored or contemptuously pitied, the good-looking boy in the simple, smart sports clothes was the object on all sides of a friendly curiosity, which he could not understand and frequently rebuffed through his very directness and inexperience. It was his weekly duty to write to Mr. Wren, and this was a dreaded task. But Mrs. Lowell explained to him that he had his grandfather's name, and that he must begin to learn to fill his place in the world. And his pitifully childish writing and misspelling had to be corrected under the eyes that were still sad at such times. I'm so ignorant, such a baby, he exclaimed one morning when this trial was being undergone. But you needn't mind it, need you, since it isn't your fault, returned Mrs. Lowell cheerfully. So many good years are coming for you to study and learn in. What will happen when the summer is over? asked the boy. Are you going to take me with you? Will Mr. Lowell like me? Indeed he will. I'm going to have you live near me. Not with you? No, Bert, that wouldn't be best. I have been corresponding with a very nice young man whom I have known a long time, and he will be pleased to live with you and give you lessons. "'In drawing?' asked the boy. "'No, sir,' Mrs. Lowell gave him the gay, smiling look he liked. It was so full of everything cheerful and kind. "'No, sir. Reading and writing and arithmetic.' "'Oh,' returned Bert, looking very serious. First, you must give your time to study.' Education is the foundation. Then, later, when you have gone through college, oh, how proud I shall be when I go to see you graduate. Shall you 
ever be proud of me? asked the boy slowly. If you will let me, she answered, it all remains with you. Then, then I'll try. I would rather stay with Mr. Blake when you go away, but if you want me to, I'll live with the young man. You will like him. He's only twenty years old, and he wants to go to college when he gets money enough. So he's glad to do tutoring now. That means helping a younger boy to learn. You'll laugh at me, remarked Bert, looking off moodily. I'd rather stay with Mr. Blake and paint the snow on the evergreens. Oh, no, dear, said Mrs. Lowell. That wouldn't please your grandfather. Besides, wouldn't you miss me? I don't like Mr. Lowell, remarked the boy. His friend laughed and took his hand between both her own. We shall all love each other, she said, and I shall hope to see you every day. Bert thoughtfully visualized the boat carrying her away without him, and decided to be glad of the other horn of the dilemma. He had learned to smile, and he did so now, looking at her so trustfully that she patted his hand as she laid it down. That's a good boy, she said. On the morning after the concert, Mrs. Wilbur regarded her child rather anxiously. Is it ever considered malarial here? she asked. The opposite extreme, said Diana. Well, you look pale. You stayed out of doors too long. The night air anywhere. Oh, but it has such a pleasant way of growing warmer here at evening. I wasn't cold, indeed, Mama. And I heard that divine voice going back through the field singing Rubenstein, said Mrs. Wilbur. She sighed. I am glad you are so matter-of-fact, Diana. He made me feel like a matinee girl, that man. Mrs. Wilbur was already planning her autumn musicale, and in fancy saw the air dark with automobiles parked in rows about the Wilbur residence in Pittsfield. She left Diana now to go upstairs to make her list, and the girl went out of doors to gather sweet peas for the living room. Pausing when her hands were full of the color and fragrance, she turned about to view the fresh morning landscape. As she did so, she heard a gay whistling that grew louder as it neared. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. The thrill of delicious terror which had come over her on waking from her short sleep that morning constricted her heart now. Philip approached. Good morrow, fair one. Posing for a study of Aurora. Diana looked around at him with deliberation. I was deciding what individuals of the fauna and flora here were most marked. Philip ducked his face down into her bouquet. You chose the sweet pea, of course. No, I decided on swallows and daisies. The swallows are ravishing, so fearless and so beautiful. Have you noticed how they dart past nearly brushing our cheeks, and how the sun brings out glints of blue in their plumage? I often mistake them for bluebirds with that touch of color on their breasts. Daisies and swallows, said Philip musingly. They do seem to belong especially. It makes me think of a song. He paused. Did you hear that booming of a new whistle this morning? There's a stranger in the cove, a swell yacht. I thought you might like to come down and see it. Yes, I should. Let me put the flowers in water, and I'll be with you. 
She reappeared quickly, and they struck off across the field to the road. "'How could I know it was a strange whistle?' asked the girl. "'I suppose you wouldn't. But to us islanders every familiar whistle is like the voice of a friend. Kelly is waiting for us in his boat. We want to row out to the beauty.' "'It was very kind of you to come way up here for me,' said Diana. There came walking toward them along the road a man in white trousers, dark blue coat, and cap with a gold insignia. "'That must be someone from the yacht now,' said Philip. Diana looked up, looked again, and, with a cry of delight, ran forward straight into the arms of the man. "'Daddy! Daddy!' she cried. "'How good of you!' The tall, handsome stranger with silver threads in his brown moustache glanced up at his daughter's escort while he kissed her. "'I had to look you up, you know,' he said while she held him tight, her arms around his neck. Loosing him, she half turned to Philip. "'This is Mr. Barrison, Daddy. We were just going down to see who was the stranger in the cove.' Mr. Wilbur shook hands with the tanned, blonde youth in a perfunctory manner, scarcely looking at him. "'Mama is here. Did you know it?' cried Diana. "'No, you don't say so. Kill both my birds with one stone, eh?' The girl held out her hand to Philip. "'I shall have to go back, Mr. Barrison. Daddy, take your card and write an order for Mr. Barrison and his friend to go over the yacht. They were just going to row out to it, and I was going with them. How little I thought it was you, dearest. She kissed him again and fumbled at her father's buttons. Philip thought there was some reluctance in the cool glance the yachtsman flung him again. Don't trouble yourself, Mr. Wilbur. Another time, perhaps. No, this minute, said Diana. Mr. Wilbur got at an inside pocket. "'Mr. Barrison will take you deep-sea fishing, if you can stay a few days. You have often spoken of it.' "'A fisherman, eh?' said Mr. Wilbur, as he took out his card and wrote upon it. Diana laughed nervously. "'Oh, no, Daddy, but he knows the ropes here.' She handed the card to Philip. "'The Idlewild is worth visiting,' she said. "'And you never can tell with these yachtsmen. They slip off sometimes in the middle of the night. A bird in the hand, you know. She smiled. Au revoir. Philip, holding his card, looked after them as they went on up the road. Diana was hanging on her father's arm. The young fellow's face flushed deeply under the tan, and his lips came together firmly. That girl is worth all the adoration a man can waste on her, he thought. I don't know that he's such a fool at that. "'What a summer, Veronica!' exclaimed Miss Burge when she found that Charles Wilbur was going to eat mackerel and sweet potatoes at her table that noon. "'Some do have greatness thrust upon them, Aunt Priscilla. First the arrival of Prince Herbert, then King Charles himself.' "'Yes, my knees feel kind of queer, Veronica.' and I think we'd better have the lobster salad this noon instead of saving it for night. The other boarders eliminated themselves so that the Wilbur family could occupy the piazza after dinner. Mr. Wilbur had praised the cooking, and Veronica had carried the good report to the kitchen. He sat now with his wife and daughter, one on each side of him, and as he smoked his cigar, looked off on the glory that is. Casco Bay. "'You're pretty nearly on a boat here, aren't you?' he said. "'It is the most wonderful place in the world,' said Diana fervently. He turned to her and pinched her chin. The excited color that had risen in her happy surprise had faded. "'You're not a good advertisement for it,' he said. "'You didn't eat anything at dinner?' "'and you look as if you'd been up all night.' "'I do think Diana feels the effect "'of all the excitement she went through in Boston,' 
said Mrs. Wilbur, and forthwith she proceeded to tell the story of the grandson of her husband's old friend, and Diana's part in it. He had met the boy at table, and he listened with absorbed interest. "'Well, little girl, well,' he said kindly, "'that was some experience. You'll have to brace up now.' "'Oh, I'm going to, Daddy, and I want to purchase some of this island. I love it here. It inspires me.' "'Better hold on,' was the quiet response. "'Why not take this place next summer? Engage Miss Burridge as cook and housekeeper. Then bring some guests and run up here for a week or so, off and on, when you feel like it.' "'That might be pleasant,' returned Diana. Her father smiled and patted her. "'You are not always going to be a tired schoolgirl.' Home may hold out more attractions next summer than you think. You don't know the rocks and the walks here yet, Daddy, said Diana wistfully. How many walks shall I have to take before you're ready to go back with me? Of course we're going back with Daddy, said Mrs. Wilbur warningly. You like the yacht, don't you, Diana? he asked. Indeed I do. It was only that you were going to have such gay people this summer, and I couldn't be gay. I understand, dear. I've ditched the gay people now, and we'll have a family party only going back. That will be delightful, replied Diana. We haven't told you the most wonderful thing yet, said Mrs. Wilbur. There is a most charming singer on the island. He gave a recital last night. Nothing commonplace. A very unusual voice. I'm engaging him for Pittsfield, Charles. He thinks he can come for a recital. He is young and little known yet, and so will be a novelty. I want you to hear him. You'll be wild, too. I promise not to be, responded her husband. But you can't help it, dear. Diana, why shouldn't we have a little dinner on the yacht, and Mr. Barrison would probably sing afterward, and your father could hear him? Let me see now. Who would we have? I don't care, put in Mr. Wilbur. So long as you have that sparkling person who sat beside the boy at dinner. Mrs. Lowell, said Diana. I'm so glad you appreciate Mrs. Lowell, Daddy. I'm not blind in one eye, and I can see out of the other. I have my hearing, too, and her voice is as fresh as a robin's. But, oh, speaking of voices, exclaimed Mrs. Wilbur, rolling up her eyes. Well, then, Diana, supposing we have just Mr. Barrison and Mr. Kelly and Mrs. Lowell. And Veronica, said Diana. The young person who waits on the table, explained Mrs. Wilbur. She and her aunt, Miss Burridge, are very worthy people. Veronica and Mr. Kelly are such good friends, said Diana. It would be too bad not to ask her. Mr. Kelly is Mr. Barrison's accompanist, put in Mrs. Wilbur. Barrison, repeated Mr. Wilbur. "'Isn't that the name of the husky I met on the road just now?' The speaker removed his cigar to ask his daughter the question. "'Yes. Mama, Mr. Barrison came up to take me down to row out in Mr. Kelly's boat to see the stranger in the cove. So when we encountered Daddy on the road, I persuaded him to give them an order to go over the yacht.' In spite of herself— the missing color came back into the girl's cheeks while she related this, and Charles Wilbur, whom no circumstance connected with his daughter ever escaped, observed it. When next he was alone with his wife, he asked a few questions as to Diana's regard for the singer. "'No, no, my dear,' she returned scornfully. "'You don't know Diana.' We have an extraordinary daughter, there's no mistake about that. 
but she was telling me the other day of her ideal for a husband. He is a fright, I can assure you, but full of charm and all that. She doesn't want to marry any man who is attractive to women. Wants to fool the vamps, eh? was the laughing reply. Why doesn't she look at her daddy? was the affectionate response. The most attractive being on earth, and one who never gave me a heartache. Charles Wilbur slipped his arm around his wife and kissed her. They were the best of friends. Don't you know, my dear, that a girl's father is always unique? He isn't a man. Oh! exclaimed Mrs. Wilbur, harking back to her find. But, Charlie, you don't know how delighted I am to have such a prize for Pittsfield. I must show you my list. She produced it, and Mr. Wilbur, frowning patiently, looked it over. He hated lists. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter 21 Goodbyes. But before the dinner party came off, Philip Barrison did take the steel man deep sea fishing. Barney Kelly was so overwhelmed by the luxury of the yacht that he refrained from saying a word against the nocturnal expedition. He happened to meet Veronica down at the post office and gave her his reasons. "'I say it's only fair that Mr. Wilbur should be racked and tortured,' he said. "'Any man so deep in the lap of luxury should learn a little of how the other half lives. That yacht is the slickest thing I ever saw. The deep-cushioned armchairs on the deck are upholstered in a light green leather, that you would think a drop of water would deface, and the salt spray doesn't faze it in the least. Then the master's room, with its twin beds, is divided from the bathroom by a sliding door, which is a huge mirror, and the dining saloon is in mahogany, with the exquisite china and glass, all enameled with the yacht's flag. Veronica's mouth always grew very small when she was deeply interested, and her eyes very wide, and they look so now as she listened. "'Just think,' she said. "'I am going to see it.' "'Good work. I wanted you to.' "'I'm going to eat off those dishes and sit in the easy chairs.' "'What's happening?' "'A dinner party. You are in it. Miss Diana told me.' "'I shall be careful to eat nothing between now and then,' declared Barney. "'for I suspect that chef of being an artist. "'Let us not count on it too much, though, Veronica. "'Harrison takes Mr. Wilbur on that unspeakable expedition tomorrow morning. "'We all may be thrown out of that dinner party "'by the violence of his feelings.' "'As it turned out, however, Kelly's apprehensions were not realized. "'Mr. Wilbur's wife and daughter were on the yacht to greet him "'when he returned from his novel experience at nearly noon of the next day. "'He had changed his clothing at Grammy's, "'and was full of praise of that old gentlewoman. "'Nice people as ever lived, those folks,' he said, "'as he stretched himself out on a chaise long on the deck under the awning "'and was served with iced drinks. "'Mama hasn't met Mr. Barrison's grandmother.' said Diana, as she placed the cigars beside her father. "'Oh, he comes of superior people. You can see that,' said Mrs. Wilbur. "'Charlie, I'm going to invite Mrs. Coolidge.' "'All right. I guess she can stand it.' "'Stand it?' echoed Mrs. Wilbur. "'You don't know what you're talking about.' "'He is still thinking about the fishing, Mama," put in Diana. "'Yes, and young Barrison,' said Mr. Wilbur. "'He's a tonic, that chap. "'The way he went over that boat. "'Regular Douglas Fairbanks stunts he did. "'He's a hundred percent man, whether he can sing or not.' "'The speaker regarded his daughter out of the tail of his eye as he talked, "'and he saw the slight compression of her lips and the glow in her eyes. 
I offered him a cigar, but he shook his head. My voice is my fortune, sir, he said. Sensible, said Mrs. Wilbur, not looking up from the silk she was knitting. When are you giving your dinner party? Tomorrow night. That's good, for we must be on our way, said Mr. Wilbur. He yawned. I'm dead to the world. I must go to sleep. Daddy, said Diana, are we really going away at once? He took her hand, and it was cold. Yes, I think we shall have to be off. He regarded her with affectionate thoughtfulness. I want to go somewhere and find some roses for you. The roses suddenly bloomed in the girl's face under his searching eyes. You want to go with your old dad, don't you? He added affectionately. Of course I do, dearest, she answered, and he forgave her the lie because she looked so pretty in her embarrassment. But I have packing to do, you know. I can't go without any warning. He continued to gaze at her and to hold her cold hand. That young Caruso of yours is quite a boy, he said irrelevantly. No lugs. Honest. Substantial. He is more than that, Daddy. He is a self-made man. <laughs> Did a good job, too. Physically, at least. No, more than that. He has been a hero to get where he is in his art. Told you so, eh? No, indeed. The roses bloomed brighter. The hand twitched in his. He gratified my curiosity one day by telling me his experiences. He thinks they were entirely commonplace. He was very poor and with no influence, but his persistence and determination won. That's the stuff returned Charles Wilbur quietly. I like the way he treats his grandmother, too. And Charlie, said his wife, looking up from her work, I believe I'll invite some people from Lenox. I'll have a house party. Very well, my dear. Her husband smiled toward her preoccupied face and released his daughter's hand. Now you run along up to the inn, Diana, said Mrs. Wilbur, and pack. Then have Mr. Blake bring the trunk and our bags aboard this afternoon. Not go back to the inn at all, afterward, then? asked Diana. No, there won't be any necessity. I told that perfectly crazy Leonie to have my things and hers ready and bring them aboard before dinner. She looked at me as if I had struck her down. Poor Leonie breathed Diana. Mrs. Wilbur shrugged her shoulders. I shall be lucky if she doesn't tell me she has decided to marry Bill Lindsay and stay here. The lady laughed and looked at her husband. I should have to invite them to take their wedding trip on the yacht, for I can't let her go until she has shown someone else how to do my hair. Let her teach me, immediately, today, said Diana quickly. Her mother stared at her. "'You don't want her to marry Bill Lindsay, I hope?' "'I do not care whom she marries,' returned Diana with amazing spirit. "'The important, colossally important thing, is that she should marry whom she pleases, when she pleases.' Mrs. Wilbur continued to stare while her husband's closed eyes opened, and he also regarded Diana as she stood up, her hands clenched. "'That was Helen Loring's creed,' said Mrs. Wilbur dryly. "'There is a better one. Don't forget that.' The girl's head drooped, and the roses faded. Ten minutes later she went down the yawning guarded steps at the yacht side, and entered the waiting boat, with its shining brasses and natty, white-uniformed sailors, to go ashore. Miss Burridge was quite touched by the feeling displayed by her star-boarder at their parting. "'I do not remember 
any period of my life which has been so happy as the last six weeks said the girl her lip quivering would you take care of me if i should take the inn for next summer and come here with friends a part of the season take the inn miss wilbur yes my father said that might be more sensible than for me to build here i would make satisfactory arrangements with you perhaps veronica would come with you then you wouldn't mind if you had the place to yourselves much of the season of course i should like an easy berth like that miss wilbur miss burridge laughed with a suspicion of moisture around her lashes at the pressure of diana's hands and the seriousness of her plaintive eyes i must say good-bye to bertie i wonder where he is up in his room i think he came in a few minutes ago there diana found him he looked up from the stretcher over which he was working and was surprised to see his friend in her street clothes are you going to boston again he asked i'm leaving permanently she answered and she took his hand and drew him down to a seat beside her he looked at her as she bit her lip while she smiled on him and he thought she was going to cry we shall be here a couple more nights but i shall be on the yacht have you seen it bertie would you like to come down with me now and go over it i'd like to make a sketch of it the boy looked interested very well you shall bill is coming for us in a few minutes you drive down with us but i want to tell you before we go how happy i am for you you don't look happy at all miss diana you look sad are you sad i am a little bit leaving here and all the friends do you know that we are related in some far-off way bertie you might call me cousin diana you mustn't forget me no i won't forget you replied the boy noticing that her lip quivered mrs lowell will write to you yes i'm sure she will said diana touching her eyes quickly with her handkerchief and mrs lowell is a wonderful friend she's told me of her arrangements for you told me about the fine strapping fellow mr lawrence who's going to be your companion and tutor i expect when i see you next that you'll stand up straight as a young soldier straight as as mr barrison said bert pulling his slender shoulders back hopefully yes as as he is and i know you will like this young mr lawrence and do everything just as mrs lowell desires to have you i am glad you can stay on longer here for it is it is a place to be happy isn't it bertie diana's lips quivered again dangerously there i hear the motor bring your sketchbook and come they descended to where leonie was standing beside the bags in her trim street clothes matt blake's wagon was waiting too and he carried diana's trunk and the various and sundry suitcases and bags which represented the wilbur party out to his wagon miss burridge and veronica saw them off mrs lowell was away in the woods with her bird glasses and the other boarders were fortunately absent diana left her good-byes for them and then with a lump in her throat got into the car leonie sat in front with her cavalier and all the way down the road her head was popping out and a stream of adieu pouring forth upon animate and inanimate objects alike herbert loring sat beside his friend and feeling wonderingly at her need for comfort slipped his hand into hers and she held it tightly diana had many good-byes to say at the float while her baggage was being lifted into the yacht's boat waiting with its picturesque crew at last they were off and bertie's eyes were greedily fixed on the lines of the handsome white yacht after the trunks were placed on the yacht she let bert look about but he was eager to get his sketch so she allowed him to descend again into the small boat and put him in command of it 
so he was taken to the point he indicated and remained there until he was satisfied with his sketch then the flashing oars fell into position and he was rowed back to the shore diana waved him a last good-bye her father was taking his much-needed forty winks her mother was downstairs somewhere and leonie stood near her straining her eyes toward the float and waving to a waiting figure thereon adieu charmant belle -Ile, she murmured sniffing audibly mademoiselle c'est comme si je quittais chez moi oui leonie nous reviendrons quelque jour there was a difference in their situations leonie had no hope of entertaining bill lindsay at dinner that function came off the next evening mr wilbur had spent much of the afternoon with philip barrison the latter had taken him out to the pound and he had watched the drawing of the nets and had had long confabs with the fishermen listening to their stories scattering cigars like hail and enjoying himself thoroughly he returned to the yacht in high good humour and made ready for the farewell festivity that's a regular fellow barrison he said to his wife as he was making his toilet oh you wait she replied i don't care a darn how he sings remarked mr wilbur but in his case a man's a man for all that i don't wonder he stopped what don't you wonder dear oh that is popularity my dear laura he added after a pause smiling at his reflection in the glass as he used his military brushes you're a wonderful woman why thank you charlie what have i done now as he did not reply but continued to smile into his own eyes she gave his arm a little squeeze as she passed him i won you anyway she said triumphantly and i need a compliment or two for i never knew diana to be so strange and changeable as she has been to-day the dear girl can't be well and i don't think i have realized quite the awfulness of her experience with herbert loring she was actually in danger for a time of being accused of hastening his death why it was dreadful poor diana poor little girl returned charles wilbur ruminatively End of chapter 21